Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is Ravi Anupindi. Good to see you back again. I'm continuing our discussion for the course COVID-19 Clinical Update module on prevention to just talk briefly about COVID-19 vaccine delivery issues. In the previous sessions, we talked about frameworks for scaling of COVID-19 testing. Given that vaccines are now out the door, I think it's important to at least spend a few minutes to talk about vaccines. What we see here is, just to give you a brief backdrop, this is truly historical. Global development and almost synchronized launch of a product is completely unprecedented in terms of the scale at which the world is attempting to do the stuff. Initial phases, of course, is discovery and development, which has been going on for the last six to eight months. Unprecedented collaborative effort to develop the vaccines and supported by, I want to emphasize here, massive investments by various governments, multilateral agencies, and philanthropic organizations. And the urgency of this was felt so acutely that what typically takes you know, years for development has been compressed into less than a year because governments and agencies were willing to bet huge in terms of taking risks in anticipation of success to begin to manufacture, for example, even before approvals were done, et cetera, et cetera. Regulatory processes relaxed, not for safety perspective, but expedited, let's say. So all of this uh, has led to some initial success, as you all know by now. There are success reported by three players, Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, and I think University of Oxford, AstraZeneca vaccine is also reported success, and hopefully more to come uh, as we see this stuff. So this is the good news on the discovery and development, but while discovery and development is necessary, it is never sufficient. So now we are in the phase of delivery, that is the vaccine needs to get to the people, the entire logistics as well as the vaccination itself. So again, just like we talked about in the COVID-19 testing kind of situation, it's useful to think in terms of an ecosystem. The ecosystem really comprises here of the entire supply chain, the players in the supply chain, which would include the manufacturers, the transportation providers, the people who are going to store and distribute the stuff, and finally, the last mile logistics reaching up to the service delivery points. And then you have the service delivery points themselves. You know, where are the service delivery points? What kind of infrastructure do they have, et cetera, needs to be also talked through. These are part of the ecosystem. The health professionals who are going to make decisions as well as administer the vaccines. Obviously, the general public is a stakeholder, stakeholder in this ecosystem because they're the people who need to get vaccinated. And, and then you have the various government entities at the federal, state, and local government levels who need to basically coordinate the activities of this entire ecosystem such that uh, vaccination for the public is done safely and effectively. I'd like to take a few moments just to talk about what the logistics of vaccine movement will look like. I'm uh, borrowing here from a DHL white paper, which is representative of what we expect to happen. Basically, from a logistics perspective, there are three kind of archetypes, archetypes of distribution system. Number one would be what might be called direct distribution, where the manufacturer will ship directly to the service delivery point. Direct meaning if it is within the country and distances are manageable, it could go on a straight truck route from the manufacturing location to the service delivery point, as we have seen happen with the Pfizer vaccine in the United States, within the United States. But Pfizer vaccines have also come into the United States from Europe, and they, those have come via air and then distributed by truck. But the main point is there could be a different modes of transport, but the vaccine is moving directly from the point of manufacturing to the point of service delivery. So those are that's kind of model one. Model two would be that depending on the size of the shipment that is coming in, could come to what is called a local cross docking center. Cross docking center is not a storage center, but basically large amount of vaccines come in and let's suppose they have to go to multiple smaller locations in terms of service delivery points. Direct shipment will work when we have a large service delivery point which also may have facilities to store. Whereas we can go through a cross docking, which takes a large shipment coming in, 
let's say in an airline, but splits into smaller shipments and goes into service delivery points. Important point with cross stocking is there is no storage. It's still moving, but the large shipment is split into smaller shipments. That's delivery model two. Delivery model three would involve storage. So the distinction between one, two, and three, the third one involves some storage. So there will be warehousing and fulfillment that will occur. And from there, it might go into smaller locations, right? So these are three different types of models that we see. Uh, As of now, what we see is Pfizer's delivery model is captured by one and two, mostly one, but they're also using two, depending on the service delivery points it's going into. Uh, At least in the United States, Moderna vaccine was just approved yesterday. And Moderna vaccine will follow the third distribution model because there'll be storage. The important point to understand here is why Pfizer might have chosen uh, direct delivery models uh, as shown in one and two, just because of the extreme temperature requirements of the Pfizer vaccine. And they wanted to minimize multiple handling of the vaccines uh, as they move through the system. Whereas the Moderna vaccine doesn't have the same extreme uh, uh, temperature storage requirements and therefore can work with the warehousing where many people will have the infrastructure to store them and then distribute. The other point I want to make here is that this is only the movement of vaccine. Now, you do have to do the vaccination. You also need, for example, syringes, PPEs, et cetera. So in the Pfizer model of one and two, you have a designated distributor, at least in the United States, who is going to separately supply the needed syringes and PPEs, et cetera, to ultimately have the vaccination. So what this is showing is only the movement of vaccines. There is going to be a separate movement. So imagine a separate player here, a distribution center like McKesson uh, identified in the United States, that's going to ship the needed supplies to the service delivery points, which means there is also a need for coordination. That is, there's no point getting the vaccines delivered to the service delivery point where they don't have the right syringes. So it requires unprecedented level of coordination to execute the direct delivery in as articulated in one and two, because the vaccines and the appropriate count quantity of syringes have to show up at the service delivery point at about the same time. Now that is bypassed when uh, that is obviated in the model three, because in model three, once you warehouse the vaccines, then that is the point where you can combine the appropriate number of vaccines with the corresponding number of other supplies that are needed, and then send the entire thing as a shipment to the service delivery point. So in that sense, the coordination level is a little bit easier when we come to model three, but the temperature requirements, et cetera, would also have to be taken into account in terms of which delivery model one would pick, right? <clears throat> So that's kind of the logistics of how the vaccine gets to service delivery point. But in doing so, there is a huge amount of planning that is required, you know, uh, service delivery point uh, and, you know, the early entities like the state level and the federal level needs to know what is the availability, quantity and timing of vaccines. You know, how much will the producer produce and when will they produce it? When will they make it available for distribution? A lot of uh, prioritization issues in terms of, you know, where should the vaccines actually go? Detailed plans uh, are being developed. Identification of delivery points, and that has also to do with the right infrastructure available. And it's a combination of prioritization and infrastructure of identification of delivery points. So for example, in the beginning, it is the uh, healthcare workers that need to be vaccinated. They are the top priority. So then we look at, you know, which healthcare facilities would you have this delivery happen and vaccination happen, and maybe some people will travel to those uh, delivery points. Ensuring the right personnel and the supplies, as I was mentioning before, all of the supplies needed to do the vaccination. So there is a vaccines and there's vaccination. To do the vaccination, you need the right personnel who know what to do, who know how to handle these products and getting the right supplies. And then important thing is you need the technology to track the patients for the two-dose vaccinations, because 
you know, there are two doses required and all of the vaccines so far approved. And if the first dose is a Pfizer vaccine, the second dose also has to be a Pfizer vaccine. So we need technology to track the patients, right? And the appropriate training to the personnel who are going to manage all this stuff. <clears throat> there are lots of cold chain issues, as you can imagine. The infrastructure, given the extreme cold uh, temperatures that are required for Pfizer versus not so extreme for the Moderna, but one needs to ensure that these are available. Log managing the logistics across the temperature ranges, that is, given the temperature to be maintained as the vaccine moves between different points, how do we ensure the temperature is maintained? And to maintain the temperature, what supplies might be needed? So, for example, in the Pfizer case, uh, there is a lot of talk about temporary uh, using dry ice. Now then, how, and dry ice need to be replenished every five days. How do we get dry ice? Where do we get dry ice from? And all that stuff. Then monitoring and tracking of these vaccines, because if there are temperature excursions happening, we need to know because anytime temperature excursion happens within a certain band, vaccines could go waste. So there needs to be technology developed to monitor and track the vaccines and ultimately minimize wastage of these vaccines. So that's another challenge that needs to be managed. A few other things, what I mean by overcoming vaccine hesitancy is there's a lot of talk about people's hesitancy to take the vaccine. That's historically been there, but much more stark here. So we need to have some kind of a education campaign, you know, messaging campaign to have the reduce the hesitancy of uh, over uptake of vaccines. And some people even, even have talked about giving incentives, maybe pay, pay people to get the vaccines. But this needs to be addressed as well. And finally, post-market surveillance. And what I mean by post-market surveillance really is that vaccines have been proved to be safe, but it is approved on an emergency basis. We need to still uh, track uh, as mass vaccinations happen, what are some of the reactions that are happening? How are, you know, do we need to correct for some of this stuff? So that feedback has to come and that will come under post-market surveillance. All of this will require unprecedented levels of coordination across the various stakeholders in the ecosystem that we have identified, which means to be able to do so effectively, given the massive scale at which this needs to happen, we will need robust governance frameworks. I'm not articulating here any new frameworks, but in the previous modules on testing, we talked about some of the frameworks. Similar frameworks could be developed for vaccines uh, in terms of various working groups or tracks, what they need to do, but also develop the right metrics, or develop uh, visual tools to manage through this stuff. This is the largest mass vaccination program that every country will go through. And this is across all ages. And therefore, just the sheer scale of this stuff is demands that we have good frameworks to orchestrate these vaccination campaigns. So hopefully, you know, the, the previous frameworks that we articulated will be useful here, right? So that's all I wanted to say. I think there's more to come in the coming days on the vaccination, and there'll be some unique challenges in developing countries that we need to watch out for. This is a hot topic of discussion right now and still evolving, but hopefully that was a little bit of an introduction on the vac vaccines and vaccination. Thank you so much.